Greetings, welcome to our Classic Album Sundays event here at the British Library. I'm Colleen Cosmo Murphy, founder of Classic Album Sundays, and it's great to see that so many of you made it. Also, greetings to the viewers that are watching us from home as well. A special announcement, don't forget there's a really good Paul McCartney songwriting display that is in the British Library Entrance Hall. It's a great exhibition. I went to see it myself. Some really, really cool things in there if you want to have a look. It's there until the 13th of March. And uh, it's, the British Library is also celebrating its season of sound. And tonight's guests have made an indelible mark in sound. Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark formed in Merseyside in 1978, and they led the way as early pioneers of British electronic music, inspiring so many different synth pop bands over the decades. Think about Depeche Mode, Pet Shop Boys, Moby, LCD Sound System, The XX, Robin. And they've really been recognized not only for their kind of musical experimentation, but also their great pop sensibility, which has allowed them to sell millions of records worldwide. Their sound has endured, and OMD are still making new music. In fact, they are going to work on a new album. Their last album was 2017's The Punishment of Luxury. And ahead, out of, ahead of their performances at the Royal Albert Hall, which they're coming up on the 14th and 15th of March, we'll be joined by the band's founding members to take a look at one of the greatest albums of 1981, Architecture and Morality. So first, we'll have a conversation with the band about the album to give us some context. After that, we will listen to the album in its entirety, uninterrupted, on this audiophile hi-fi featuring these great loudspeakers from Danley Sound Labs. They sound fantastic. While we do listen to the album, I ask that you keep your phones off um, and to refrain from conversation and just give yourself over to the music. Just turn yourself over to the album and give, it its, give the album its full attention. If you're watching from home, we also encourage you to play the album using whichever format's available to you, whichever physical format or streaming option. We can't broadcast the album due to copyright reasons. Once the replay finishes, just before 9 p.m., the viewers at home can rejoin us, and you'll have the opportunity to ask the band your own questions. And for the viewers at home, there's going to be a little form underneath the video, the video box that you can put your question on, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Andy McCluskey and Paul Humphreys. Hello. Hello, everyone. Well done for making it. Yeah, well done. Yeah, this is, this Only just so made well. it myself. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. Very happy to be here. And yeah, I know that you have so much going on right now with a tour starting in the US as well. So we really mm -hmm. appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. When we look back at this album, I like to give it a little bit of context. And I want to take a look back to what Merseyside and Liverpool were like when you started the band in 1978. If you can give us a little bit of a idea of what the kind of music scene was like back then. Grim. <laughs> yeah, bleak, I would say, really. <laughs> the city was bleak, anyway. But mm -hmm. there was a very big, vibrant music scene, you know, mm. and it all sort of centred around Eric's club right. in Liverpool, you know, because, mm -hmm. I mean, when the first time we played there, um, you, you basically are playing to all the other Liverpool bands, you know, yeah. they're all... You know, Which you're is playing, terrifying. Yeah, you're playing to Echo and the Bunny Man and Teardrop Explodes mm -hmm. and China Crisis. And, <laughs> <laughs> And was there a lot of competition between the bands? Was there friendly rivalry or was there a it lot of support? Friendly. It was friendly rivalry because we were all in the same boat. We were all kids. Nobody knew the music. Nobody, you know, nobody had a record deal. And it was a case of, you know, you'd be playing there and, the, and everybody would be as far back from the stage as they could get. Nobody was uncool enough to come down the front. Yeah. And you just, you just know they're all sitting there going, well, you know, they're all right, but they're shit compared to us. <laughs> and that, you just yeah. knew they were all saying that under their it, breaths, yeah. you know. <laughs> that, that it was... Uh, but it was, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, the, the month that we played, we played in October 78, and the Bunnymen and the Teardrops all 
they played on the other Thursdays in that same month. All they, the first they, gigs. Their first ever gigs. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Now, was Roger Eagle also DJing there as well? Was he, he one of the DJ. DJs? Yeah, he was the uh, he was like the owner. He was the owner, but the, the the music that was played there by the DJs was quite eclectic, as I heard, and it really kind of influenced a lot of different bands fabulous, as well. Yeah. They basically they wouldn't play anything that was popular. Right. <laughs> um, so they played a, a, a lot of old like rock and roll and rockabilly that you never heard of, uh, a lot of kind of underground dub reggae. And then, yeah, I mean, the summer of 78, we were in the club and uh, Norman Killen played Warm Leatherette by The Normal. And it was life changing for us. Yeah, Paul and I were like, what the hell? And so I went up and said, what is that? You know, that's The Normal, they're English on mute records. And, um, and so I came back to Paul and was like, li literally, it was, it was inspirational because it was like, somebody's listening to what we're into and yeah. they've made a record. So it's like, it was a challenge. It was like, okay, maybe we should... Um... Get out of my mum's back room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which your mother was happy about. <laughs> she was uh, so, yeah, so we, that, that, that made it, okay, let's, let's, let's actually go and do a gig because they had this open door policy on Thursday night. Mm -hmm. But you were already into electronic music with uh, Kraftwerk and Noi. Yeah, I mean, I mean how, did, how did you get into that? Because it wasn't... It was quite simple, really. I had a record player that I'd built because I had an actual stereo record player, not the sort of mono down set, actually, because I was a, I'm a nerd, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I Welcome built, to my world. Uh, I, I was interested <laughs> in electronics as a kid, so I built all our early instruments as well, and I built a stereo. So but Andy used to go and take all his pocket money and go into Liverpool, go to the German uh, uh, import section, buy as much as he could, come round to my house, and we listen to it yeah. together. It was oh, kind of a symbiotic relationship. I had the vinyl, he had the record deck. <laughs> and, and, and so we, we used, to, used to, I mean, the, the thing was, I mean, his, his poor mum used to work six days a week, so she was working on a Saturday. So Saturdays, mm -hmm. that's why we were at his house, because yeah. there was nobody there yeah, to man. annoy with the music. Apart from the neighbours. Quite loud. Yeah. Apart from yeah. the neighbours that we used to really yeah. annoy yeah. about. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Now, your first single came out in Factory in Manchester. Wasn't there a bit of a rivalry between the two cities, with, between Liverpool and Manchester? How was that viewed from your, uh, from the local, you know, scene? Yeah, it was difficult for us because I mean, we we were sort of a Wirral band, so we weren't mm. like considered. The, the the people from Liverpool didn't really consider. We were outsiders, band. even in Liverpool. Right. We yeah. Were on the wrong side of the river. Yeah. And, and also, uh, we we were horribly uncool looking. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I had a big white boy afro, really? and, 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 <laughs> and I had really long hair and an attempted moustache that just wouldn't grow. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, mean it, it, I remember Peter Savile finally got hold of us when we were on Factory, and he just said, your music sounds like the future, but you look terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Cut your hair. Yeah. So we style yourself. So we did, so we did. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, th there... The strange thing was that, I mean, there was a record label in Liverpool called Zoo Records mm -hmm. that was run by Dave Balfe and Bill Drummond, yeah. but yeah, they, they, refused to sign they us. didn't sign us. Um, and so we, I mean, the, the funny thing is, uh, many of you will probably know this story because we thought it was always apocryphal, but we found out it was true that we finally spoke to um, Lindsay Reid, who was married to Tony Wilson. Mm -hmm. And apparently, yeah, we, we sent in a cassette because we'd met him, our second ever gig, we met him at the factory. And he, he used to present bands on the local news and we thought we'll try and blag on. You know, mm -hmm. and she gets in the car and, and, and um, she says, oh, what's, what's, what are all the cassettes in the bag, love? I said, I'm taking them to the tip, getting rid of them. <laughs> Cassette, rubbish cassettes that people want to get on the telly. It's all, it's all crap. <laughs> and she, she leered to him and went, oh, orchestral maneuvers in the dark. That's a strange one. Put it on. Said, they played the club the other week. They're rubbish. I'm not interested. And she yeah, went, Tony didn't really like us. That's a hit. Really? Played, it was electricity. She said, that's a hit. So Sign them, is what and she so, said. So, so, so we went... All right, love, just for you, I'll sign it. That, that's how you get a record deal. Yeah. That oh is a God. true. That is a true story. We didn't Fish, believe it. Fished out of the bag on the way to the tip. We got a record. It's we a true story. We didn't believe it, but Lindsay came to one of our shows recently. We said, "Look, you've got to tell me if this is true or not." And it I mean, was. yeah. And Tony was very good at rewriting history. So the next week when we met him, he goes, "You guys are the future." Of pop. <laughs> Typical Tony. Little yeah. did we know we were on the way to the tip seven days earlier, but you know. So. He didn't tell you that. Yeah, he didn't tell us that. Um, I want to just talk quickly about your second album because obviously it's a very pertinent track to what is happening today. Uh, the organization named after uh, Ralph Hooter and Florian Schneider's first collective before they, they mm -hmm. did craft work. Exactly, of course. I mean, do you find it, number one, that it's kind of important to pay tribute to the people that inspired you or the people that paved the way in electronic music? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, even 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 the last album we did on Punishment to Luxury, we're sort of tipping our hat to Kraftwerk mm -hmm. as well. 
we sort of went back to our roots on the last album. Yeah, we? I mean, no, we, we've it never made like any I mean, Listen, no, nobody creates in a vacuum. Yeah. You, you, you find inspiration. Mm. Um, and, and, and obviously, you know, craft work changed our lives. I mean, one of the things that we don't often mention enough, I think, is that the other band from Dusseldorf, Noi, yeah. were actually... Yeah. as influential because massively important. what we didn't realise was that unconsciously we were welding the two things together. We had Kraftwerk's melody and kind of ideological kind of uh, simplicity, but we had noise kind of energy and emotion. Mm. And I think that the two, you know, if I look back now, it seems like a logical co combination. We weren't doing it consciously, but I'm sure that that was, that was an element. Mm. But I think also, I mean, if we had lots of money when we started out, and we weren't two poor boys from working class families, we could have bought synthesizers and probably would have sounded a lot more like Kraftwerk than actually we could, because mm -hmm. we didn't have the technology to be able to sound like Kraftwerk. So we had to use whatever we had, whatever I made, whatever we could buy from secondhand shops to try to create an electronic sound. But of course, it didn't sound at all like Kraftwerk. It sounded like OMD, so. Yeah, but it still had a polished sound. And do you think that people, because the sonics are really great on, on, on your records, do you think that people maybe had a misconception that you were actually a posh band, in a sense? Or do, did um, people understand that it was that you were, had working class roots? Because class yeah. being such an important thing here in Britain. I think, <laughs> with, I think with the incredibly pretentious name, <laughs> I think a, lot, a lot of people thought that may, may, maybe we were some kind of like, you know, <laughs> English lit students or something. Yeah. But, uh, no, it was just, um, I, 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 it, I don't know how we, how we ended up with getting such a clear vision. Because when we started out, when we were 16, I mean, it, it was very, very ambitious. Literally, I had an upside down bass guitar mm. and he literally was cannibalizing his aunt's radios for the circuit yeah, for boards. the parts, for none of, none of their radios ever worked ever again. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they wised up and they stopped lending them. Yeah, but, but basically, um, that we were just making the weirdest ambient noises that just, you know, no wonder our mates thought it was crap. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, and and, and it, was, it was only when some friends from school were selling off cheap, a cheap Vox organ and an electric piano that that's when he started actually playing keyboards. And, and literally, yeah. you know, I was learning to play bass and he was learning to play keyboards as we were writing songs. And we, we wrote electricity when we were still 16. That's amazing. Yeah. When we wrote electricity, I could barely play it. I mean, it took me ages. It's a really tough Things melody change. to well, I think a lot of I the still bands. can't really do it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen this live? <laughs> I think a lot of the bands that your contemporaries at that time was the same, the same thing anyway. So it's very ins inspirational. Yeah. In sense. But I mean, you didn't have to coming out of prog rock. And it was the punk sensibility as yeah. well. You know, you didn't have to play. You just had to have something to say. But you didn't yeah. want to be perceived as a punk band, did you, from the start? Um, no, I mean, no. The, the thing is, we had actually found our alternative in 75 with the German music before mm. punk kind of hit. So yeah. we like the punk ethos. As Paul said, it's yeah. like, you know, well, you know, you're playing three chords and we're playing with one finger like, like that. It's like punk on synth, really. Um, and and the, the great thing was, though, that the new wave clubs gave us a place to play. Yeah. Um, yeah, all the punk clubs opened up around the north of yeah. England. So and and, and, and venues, yeah. Interestingly, yeah. though, there, there weren't really any punk bands in Liverpool, were there? No, there wasn't. We actually. were all pretentious. I mean, look at the names. <laughs> look at the names look of the, the names. bands from yeah, Liverpool. Just says I mean, it all, really. all of us completely <laughs> pretentious. <laughs> Fabulous names. <laughs> Let's talk about the song. It's not on this album, but on organization, Anola Gray, because okay. I think it's with the Russian invasion into the Ukraine. I think mm. this song may be more pertinent than ever. What inspired you to write this song? Sadly, things don't seem to change. I, I, yeah. I really genuinely thought I was never going to see another war in my lifetime in Europe, so I'm, yeah. I'm very... Hopefully not a nuclear one. Yeah. But, um, yeah, hopefully not a nuclear one. Um, he alluded to the fact that he's a geek. I'm a geek as well. Um, he used to build model railway mm -hmm. scenes. Yeah. I mean, the whole back. Yeah. We, had to, we, the, we had to fit the music As around kid, your bloody that, railway yeah. thing that was like tunnels and trees. And, <laughs> and, and I had I to keep soaring bits off to give us more room. <laughs> yeah, and I, I had an entire air fleet hanging from my bedroom wall on, yeah. as I used to build airfix um, air models. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, if, you're, if you're interested in aeroplanes, and I was always fascinated by the well, morality in inverted commas of warfare, that, that people, people in a, t a time of war, the, the, the moral compass is almost 180 inverted. It's like, you know, you're encouraged to go and kill people mm. rather than not. And, and, and so I, I was just fascinated by the moral dilemma of war. And if, so if you're interested in aeroplanes and moral dilemmas of warfare, you come to Enola Gay. 
You know, I mean, and, and to the day he died, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who flew the plane, believed that, you know, by killing 140,000 people, he saved five million. Mm -hmm. And he always believed it was the right thing to do. So that, that was... His moral certainty was remarkable. I don't think I could do it. I always see black and white. I see all the different sides of everything. But, but I, I haven't been in a war, so... I, Maybe that's what he had to do to convince himself yeah. to, to not yeah. go crazy. But, but you know, yeah. at, least, at least he did a nice thing. He named the plane after his lovely mum. Yeah. <laughs> she must have loved that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Very <flattered>, you know. <laughs> uh, but the, also, you know, because we, 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 we grew up in the 60s and 70s, and we... You know, it was very close to the Second World War, and our, our parents were in it. I mean, my dad was a prisoner of war. He was held in the Black Forest, forced to be a lumberjack for the Nazis, you know. And so and my mum was a corporal in the army. So we grew up with war mm -hmm. stories, you know. So we've always been kind of fascinated by war. Uh, that's why we have the Messerschmitt twins. That's why we have bunker soldiers. I mean, there's a kind of a theme going through a lot of our early stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of getting out of all that war. We don't celebrate war, but we, we, celebrate we were it. fascinated by it. And yeah, we, we, yeah, were, we were born not long after the Second World War, which, you know, still kind of uh, informed a lot of people's attitudes mm -hmm. in, in the UK mm -hmm. yeah, when we were kids. When you set about to record your third album as your follow-up to organization, what would become Architecture and Morality? Did you have a certain kind of creative mission or any kind of thematic kind of concept that you were working to? What was in your head before you set foot into the studio we, with what you wanted to do? We were basically, I mean, our, our kind of whole reason for creating a band and being in the band was to always try to do something new and challenge ourselves mm -hmm. and push yeah. musical boundaries. So we'd done the first album, which were songs we'd written from like the age of 16 to 19. It was kind of like garage synth punk. Then the second album, I'm sure, was unconsciously influenced by, by Joy, Joy Division. Division. It was a lot definitely. darker and more melancholy, apart yeah. from Enola Gay, mm -hmm. although the subject matter was dark. And then when we got to Architecture Morality, we, we were, again, we just, we just wanted to change the sound again. That, that, was, that was our mission, to be different. Right, we've done that, we've done that, now we're going to do something else. And we didn't know where we were going, but we were just trying to always do something different. We had, we had some new toys. We had a Mellotron, mm -hmm. yeah. so we could play choirs and Choral strings and, and things. things. Yeah. You know, sounds that we hadn't had access to previously. Um, that always influenced us, uh, the technology, because the technology of synthesizers was advancing quite quickly in that time. Mm. You know, and, and the synthesizers were getting cheaper and more interesting and more exciting. So we were kind of, we were getting a bit more money, so we kept buying new synths. And, and you're always inspired by, by new possibilities, you know. It like, is great when you get a new toy out and you go, you hit, yeah, a, new, you go, oh, you just, you hit a new sound, you go, ooh, there's a song. <laughs> yeah. I can, oh, that oh, sound, a that's going to be a song. Yeah. Would that inspire the lyrics <coughs> and the themes as well, the actual sonics, so that you would, like, the sounds you would get out of the Mellotron? The lyrics always came on top of the music. The music was written first, but I would always be researching or collecting ideas for lyrics. But I, would, I made a point I never write down words that were going to be lyrics. I would just collect ideas and phrases and information. I mean, you know, when I did In Ola Gay, mm -hmm. when I did Joan of Arc, I would, went to the library, got books out, and started making notes. Like no a, internet then? Yeah, yeah. No, no Wikipedia. No, no Google. I, would just, I was just, you know, basically collecting information as though I was making notes to write an essay. Mm. Uh, and then we'd do some music, and at some point I'd go, You'd merge the lyrics. Maybe I could sing that on that. Yeah. And, and, and then, because you hadn't written the lyrics or got a melody or anything, then organically, the lyrics would come out of, out of the music. I, I don't, just because we don't, and I don't know how people do it, I have no idea how people write the words first and then put the music to them. We've never done that. It's always the other mm -hmm. way around for us. Always the other way around. The lyric and the, and the lead melody is quite often the last thing we write on the song. Really? Yeah. We'll Which is the thing that oh. most people we'll do first. You know, get, and that, that's, that's the hook. That's how we but work. that's usually the last thing. Well, this is so interesting because you do, of course, everyone just said this about you and it's so evident in your music. You have one foot in, you know, sonic and musical experimentation and the other foot is in great pop songs. Although you do twist those conventional song structures anyways. Um, we only do it because we don't know what we're actually doing. Well, I was we wondering... don't know what the conventional song structure is. I, I was wondering, are you unlearning <laughs> it? Or are, are you unlearning it? it? We never, we never learned, learned it. We never learned it. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, Stuart, who now plays drums for us, is, is, is a, is a, he, he, he actually went to music college. And he, and he sometimes he analyses things. He sometimes says, oh, do you know, what? Do you know why that really works? It's because you've got just two notes in the chord here and then you add the fifth when you go to the chorus. And then the seventh, I'm like... It's like, really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just well, I had 
no idea we were doing yeah. that. It just <laughs> felt right to us, you know. That's interesting. So, I mean, we're instinctive. We're a, yeah. I mean, we never had a music lesson in our life. Mm -hmm. And we got kicked out of the recorder group in school when yeah. we were nine, so yeah. we, didn't even, we didn't even learn to play recorder when we now, were kids. Uh, in fact, my mum had, uh, she, she was quite proud of it, actually. She had my, my, my report from the music teacher uh, that said, Paul Humphreys has no aptitude for music whatsoever. <laughs> and, she, and, and, she, and she put it in a frame on a wall <laughs> when, after my first Top of the Pops. Yeah, af <laughs> after you were successful. She wasn't very impressed <laughs> no, by it to begin with. Exactly, yeah. I was in the doghouse to begin with. <laughs> That's amazing. So you spent like a couple, a couple of months recording with uh, Roger Manwaring uh, as pr yeah. production. Richard, Richard Manwaring, yeah. And then you also had your own gramophone suite as well. Yeah. So what were you doing in your own studio as opposed to the, to the bigger? Well, when we um, when we first uh, uh, signed a deal, it was a seven album deal, and the first advance was quite big, and we thought we were shit. So we thought we would never get taken up for the other six albums after the first one. Mm -hmm. So we thought, let's spend the, the advance on a recording studio so that when we get dropped by the label, we'll have a business. That's a smart idea. We were budgeting so, for failure. Budgeting for failure, yeah. <laughs> so we had this great studio, so, which was brilliant in, in a way because we had a place to work that was technically really good. And so we did the bulk of all the first sort of four albums, wasn't it, uh, mm -hmm. in the gramophone suite. And then we get them to a certain stage and then we go into a professional studio to finish them. Mm -hmm. and e either we would re-record, which was usually traumatic because you're so used to your demo, the new yeah, recording sounds right. different. Or what was usually better was we had a 16 track tape machine. And when you put it onto a 24 track tape machine, they kind of panned out and you'd get, you'd get eight more tracks so you could overdub and change things and, mm. and add them. That, was always, that worked best when we could actually use our, our tape, tape and, yeah. and embellish it rather than have to start again. But the thing was, because there's always been two of us in the writing process, even when we were kids, we used to have to write using a tape recorder because we couldn't do everything. We only had two, you know, so we, four we, hands. So we would put some drums or something on the tape recorder. No computer. This, yeah. this is one of the things why OMD songs are very, you know, again, we didn't know the rules. It was just the practicality. It, they're, they're linear because we just lay down four minutes, the same all the way through, and we would go, you know, and we'd go, oh, we'll do this, and then we'll do that, and then we'll drop it out, and then we'll change the melody. But it, it's always like, Enola Gay, it's the same four chords all the way through. Messages is one sequence that are going all the way, and we just yeah. change change uh, what's going on yeah. playing with it so we all, we, all, we always wrote on, 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 on tape i mean the yeah. the one time actually that his poor mother was too sick to go to work in the shop <laughs> on saturday <laughs> we were learning we bunker were soldiers. we were writing bunker soldiers yeah. and we, we just had this bass line on on on, on the tape which is and then we'd wind it back again da -da -da -da. and we were trained by the what should we do and you know, about five hours later his mother came down like and six went, it's a nice song, but do you know any others? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was just the same. Yeah. Like wind the mom. tape back, wind the tape back. It was She's very patient, mom. my mum. Yeah. But the she mood? lost her patience then. <laughs> she lost her patience then. <laughs> what was the mood like in the studio when you were recording that album? Are well, there I'll any good stories mountain. you could share? Well, it was great, actually, because we worked at, um, uh, at the Manor Studios, mm -hmm. which was... Richard Branson's place that he charged us full price for. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> On the label, but you still charge us full price. And, uh, but it was a fantastic studio, because it was like we were in our own world. I mean, two working class kids going to a mansion house in Oxfordshire mm. that, you know, had a swimming pool and a lake a and a go-kart track. Go -kart and track, -kart and. track and, and, you know, you sat at this baronial table. You know, the, 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 the video for Made of Orleans, that's the dining room at the, at the moment, studios. Yeah. And, you know, they had a full-size snooker table and it was just, and it was just like, you know, people making breakfast for you. And, Do you want something else? We'd like something else. We'll bring it into the studio. It was, it was unbelievable. It's a totally different way of life, but we did we did we did work hard. I mean, we, we worked really hard, yeah. And it was, um, yeah, it, it was a, it was an amazing experience. I mean, for us, because you know, Paul said we didn't think we were going to get past the first album. So to be making a third album and having already had hits, it was like wow. You know, we're just making this up as we go along, and people are actually buying it. Great, you know, <laughs> results. But we didn't have to follow anybody's rules. You know, the, re the record, the amazing is the record company just left us get on. Yeah, they said, yeah. Well, do what you do. You know, they just, they just we won't interfere. You know what you're doing. We trust you, you know. Yeah, we, we just phone up and say, We didn't right. trust ourselves, but they trusted us. Yeah. That's <laughs> really great. great. And you know. we, um, because we'd made records in a kind of weird way, we didn't really want a producer. 
So we, we, we'd done some work in the manor, and, and Richard Mannering was, was the house engineer. So we said, can we just go in with Richard, who will make it sound good, um, but, we'd be in but, control. but we will actually produce it because we, yeah. you know, I mean, things like no, Made of Orleans, the bass drum in Maid of Orleans is not a drum kit. It's a gigantic big military. It's just going boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And Souvenir, it's a rotaton. It's just, doo -doo. and it's a, most producers are going, no, can't, no, you can't do you that. Can't do that. Yeah. And we were like, well, there's, Why not? there's nobody here to say no. We're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. So it, it, was, it, was, it was really, really wonderful. Um, it was an amazing, amazing place to be, you know, mm -hmm. working class kids to be in this mansion. And, um, and we found it a really creative atmosphere. You know, we, we, we did such good work there. But we, was, we were full of ideas. You know, we, we, yeah. we had not emptied the barrel at all. You know, we, we just had all these ideas and we were so buzzing off the fact that, you know, we were allowed to do this. Yeah. We, we were allowed to make records. It was our job to write songs and play them. And, yeah. and, because we were off the back of Enola Gay being a massive hit around Europe as well, so yeah. we knew we were on the right track. Mm. So we just thought, you know. So we, yeah, and, and we were just doing what the hell we felt like doing. I mean, you know, the, the title track, Architectural Morality, you know, we made, we made it up in the studio. In the manor, we, just, yeah. we just went, right, we're going to, let's make some noises. And then we, let's, let's get a load of stones. Yeah, from smash some stones and some <laughs> bottles and things in the studio and just. It was just. Anything we wanted. And when we wrote Made of Orleans, it was, you know, it was too short. So mm. we're like, we need to extend it. Well, maybe we could kind of create this sonic landscape and then the song will emerge out of it. And, you know, massive hit single. Biggest selling song in Germany in 1982. And it starts with 30 seconds of, of noises, distortion. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, how it got played on the radio, I have no idea. It would definitely not go played incredible. now. It's incredible. I so, think it's a lot so of incredible. DJs used to skip the intro, actually. Did they? Oh, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> kind of, they kind of dropped the needle a bit further in. You know? further. They only played the intro when we went in to do the interview. Is that what it was? God. Yeah, and then they were talking to us and they had the volume pulled yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. okay. I love the Sonics and Sealand. I mean, that one mm -hmm. is my, probably my favourite song. And, and uh, it reminds me... Well, uh, actually, it was kind of another nod of the hat to Noi, wasn't it? Because they have a song. That's Correct. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, but it really sounds like that kind of David Bowie low or another green world that ha has that kind of a feel to it. Mm -hmm. At the very end of that song, there is this kind of, it almost sounds like a train on a train track, huh? maybe <laughs> going back to your train sets, but uh, it's almost like a metallic kind of sound. What, what is that? Goodness knows what we used that. <laughs> Don't remember. Yeah. 40 years ago, we were making it up as we went along. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is part of, you know, when we come to play songs that we haven't played for a long time, we have to go back and get the multi-tracks. Mm. Because we're looking at each other going, what did we make what that we sound do? with? I don't How know. did we do that? What is that sound? <laughs> and, and so we actually have to sample them off the record to, to, to put them into the keyboards. Thing. So, um, I mean, Sealand was, there's a place in southwest of the Wirral Peninsula called Sealand. Mm -hmm. And we'd done Stanlow, which was on the other side, which is an oil refinery. So Sealand, yeah, noise song. And we, I, li I like the kind of the fact that it was somewhere sort of that liminal kind of between the land and the sea. And, and uh, also being a history buff and knowing that, you know, Bronze Age people used to, you know, put things into the water because it was, you know, where the gods lived, sort of between the land. So that, that was, we were try trying to conjure that, I think. And we just created this... Yeah, we just again we just laid down a drum machine for a long time, then yeah. played the drum, and we, that, that was it. And then we'd like, okay, well we'll just do a bit of this, and then we'll do a bit of that, and then okay, well we've done that for three minutes, so let's do something else. And it's just yeah, we just we just literally made it up as we went along, and and it was. Yeah. Um, but it's a beautiful song, and we I, I remember we did it with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember going to the rehearsal; it was like a playthrough, and they got to the end and they did this unbelievable end on it, and I was crying. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is beautiful. It's, yeah. uh, souvenirs. We should talk about. You yeah. wrote that one. Is one of your yeah. one of your hits. I mean, funnily enough, that was the um, it was the first time that we started using choirs, and I, I, I owe it all to Dave Hughes actually, who was in the band early earlier, and uh, who was in the band Dalek. I love you, um, because. That song wouldn't have existed without Dave because uh, he started doing film music and he was working at a studio down the road and he'd, he, was, um, he was recording a choir. And, uh, and the choir was so good that he paid them for three hours, but they'd done it in two hours. So, so Dave said, you're not going home yet. 
So uh, you're going to sing long notes for me, all of you, to do and sing several octaves of long notes, as long as you can make them. And you've just recorded them. And then one early evening, I knock on the, I don't know why I was there by myself, but he knocked on the gramophone suite, our studio door, and said, look, I've got all these tapes of these choirs, and I know you can make, make loops of them so we can, you know, so they're endless. If you make the loops, I'll let you have a copy and you can use them and I'll, I'll take, we'll both have a copy of them if you make the loops. So we did the loops and then he went and I thought, yeah, these choirs sound really good. And so I just printed all these notes that lasted four minutes. Just every, every track was a note. And then I just started blending these notes and then just souvenir appeared, you know. But you were basically, you were playing the mixing desk, I was playing the mixing desk, yeah. That's an F, that's a G, that's a C. <laughs> and, and he uh, said you don't know anything about music. There you are, Nate. <laughs> it's, but you know what, it's all by ear. We do all it by all ear. by yeah. ear. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when we're writing together, um, you know, it, it, Paul's usually the one who's playing the melody and I'm sitting at the desk and, and, and he, he'll play a phrase and I go, I like that, but can you go, da, nah, and I, I don't know what note is, I'm just yeah, like, hearing, just, can you go, nah, and then, it, nah, yeah. and then, I like the third phrase, bring it to the second phrase, and then and it just, yeah. it's well, completely work, <coughs> off the top of our heads and we don't even know, I don't even know what note he's playing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's just literally, you know, play that note, sing, you know. It's, 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 it's always been intuitive. It's just, do, does, it, does it feel right? Does it sound right? Mm -hmm. and, and then with Souvenir, you know, the, when I'd done the choirs, they were so, um, so sort of dense in harmonics when, uh, because of all the beautiful voices that the, the tune just sang itself to me, really. Yeah. I could hear the tune in the choir. And so it, so it was very easy to go... Da, 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 da. I could just hear it. Wonderful. The, the harmonics, and then it was done really quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Done in a day. And a big hit. And then we have writing about Joan of Arc. I mean, you mm -hmm. said you earlier you were a history buff. Mm -hmm. And I think there's always been some kind of intellectual element to a lot of your lyrics, I would say. I don't know if you pseudo agree with that. Pseudo-intellectual. Pseudo-intellectual, perhaps. For, but but th thank you for dropping the pseudo. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of you. <laughs> Why Joan of Arc? I mean, this is 550 years after she passed away. Well, we away. toured France, didn't we? Yeah, we were yeah. touring France, and the, and the support band said, oh, this is like the Joan of Arc tour you're playing in. Ding. So when I went back, went to the library, and um, I ended. I, I wrote "Made of Orleans" first, mm -hmm. uh, and those of you who have heard the original demo now, with the horrible bass line, do, 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 you can understand why I didn't think it was working at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to write, and I was determined I was going to have a song about Joan of Arc. So I thought, scrap that, write another one. And in fact, the, the song Joan of Arc was written on the, I don't know, it was something like the 550th anniversary mm. of the day she died. Um, and I, I thought that was the one that was working. And, and literally, Paul and Malcolm came into the gramophone suite when we were packing up to go to the Manor Studios. And we were talking about the songs that we were going to do. And, and yeah, and, and I, think, I think you said, what's happened to the 3-4 song? And I said, it's not working, that's why I've written the other one. And then Malcolm just went, well, if you let me play drums, I'll make it a hit. <laughs> and he did, and it was. And he was. Wow. <laughs> Typical Malcolm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and, but, but typically as well, it was like, you know, again, the, the bass drum was played separately, and then the snare drum was played separately, then the floor tom was played separately, and then it was like, OK, Mal, now how are you going to do that on stage? Yeah, it's exactly. Like <laughs> <laughs> and then the end, where the drums... <laughs> so it was managed. like all of that, you know. Yeah. But, um, he somehow managed it. Yeah, it was so... Uh, yeah, it was just literally I was determined to have a song and we ended up with, with two. So but why, is, why two. a song about, jo why two songs about Joan of Arc? Well, well because one, one wasn't working, so I wrote the other one. But, but why, why her as a topic, I guess is the um, question. I, do you know what? I think the more I read about her, the more I got fascinated by the difficulty of understanding. Because she's, she, it's as if though she's mythical and also she's invested <laughs> with all sorts of meaning dependent upon who you talk to. You know, there are feminists, there are nationalists, there are... Everybody comes in with their own agenda and will spin her... Because, because very little is really known about her definitively. So everybody can take her and spin the story to their own agenda. Mm. And so it's like the more I read, the less I knew, mm -hmm. which, which to me, again, was this grey area. 
I, I became fascinated by this kind of like, well, you know, she can be, she can be anybody I want her to be because the, even the historians write about her in a, in a different way. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to go back to when I was, you know, 21, 22 and get into my head. I was just, I was just enjoying being in this space where I was swimming in these currents of like, I, I want to write something about Joan of Arc, and she did this, and that, but I don't know. But again, I, I personalised it. You know, I wrote about as, as though it was somebody I knew, um, and so you know, and, and then you know, you know, and you know, she did this and she did that, but without me, I don't, I don't, know, I don't even know where the lyrics come from. They just come out, and you go, that's working. Mm. And then pe people read into it stuff that you know you've pulled it out of your subconscious, and you have no idea why you wrote those yeah. words. Mm -hmm. You have no idea. Subsequently, when people ask you questions about it, you know you, you can't do an interview and say, "Well, so tell us about Joan of Arc." Mm. Well, it just seemed like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, that that, that, story. That, that's the end of the conversation, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. Kind of up. Yeah, you've got to come up with some kind of like. <laughs> You know, yeah. after the event legitimizing of a creative yeah. process that you have no idea what you're actually doing. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing I love about songwriting. That you just, you know, you can go into the studio in the morning and in the evening you've got something that wasn't there in the morning mm -hmm. that you actually really And if like. it's good, it's great. And Nine times out of ten, you go home yeah, and go, yeah. 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 <laughs> That was a waste of time. Should have got the pub. Now, the album <laughs> opens with the new Stone Age and mm -hmm. that song sounds completely different than the rest of the album. It does sound yeah. a lot more post -punk. We wanted to shock people as well with that. Why, why, why did you want to shock people with the opening well, song? Well, to, to say that we were, we were doing something different. I mean, that, it, that was our kind of, our, our, our ethos, our sort of remit, was to each album to, mm -hmm. to, try, to, to try to do something different. And it's me playing guitar on it, which is pretty shocking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, it, but again, inspired by Brian Eno. I mean, it's mm, kind of yeah. like scratchy. He used to call it ostrich guitar. It's just like... Tick, 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 yeah. tick, 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 tick. I mean, when I'm on stage, I don't know, you know if you actually watch me playing guitar on stage the rare times I play it, it is tuned to an open E chord. I don't even have to use my fingers. I just, just bar it. Just one finger. And so, uh, um, you know, new, new, new Stone Age. It's just literally, it's, it's F it's open. and A. Yeah. And I have it capoed on the F, tuned to E. So it's just, it's like, so when I let go of it, it's just the right chord. So F, F major, and then I A it. <laughs> it's idiot proof guitar play. Because when it comes to guitar play, I am an idiot and it needs to be proof. So um, I idiot proof the keyboards as well. I only give them three notes to play. And, uh, <laughs> in Forever so, Live and Die. Some, somebody should put a camera behind me one time on Forever Live and Die. I've got three lights. Yeah. These, these are the notes you play. Every other note I've is deleted. switched off. I've deleted all the other notes. So and I play still the play one. the wrong notes. <laughs> well, they're all the right notes, just not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> but the, the other thing about New Stone Age was it, it, it was another song. Uh, it was a song that I was writing that didn't work, and then I had this idea, and I was I was in I was impatient, I was in a hurry, and I went, mm. all right, there's this song that's got a, a bass drum on it, just going do 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 do. So I said, right, switch off all the other channels, put it into recording, and then and I started, playing. and then so I wrote New Stone Age, and then as I stopped playing things and came out of record, these other channels. From the previous from idea. From the previous idea. Start, so when you theory. listen to New Stone Age, when you, as you get to the end, it morphs into this completely out of tune other song. And that's why it sounds the way it does. Because hell to play on stage when it does that. We just we all have to kind of morph into a new song. I know, I mean, it's, because we've just done it as well. And Martin is always like, when do I when come do I in change? with that when do I change? I said, It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Any time you feel like yeah, it after I've it. stopped singing, just because it all falls apart. <laughs> and that's, and that's, and, but again, because we liked the fact that we were doing something kind of messed up and weird. We kept it, we just went, yeah, let it all fall apart, let it morph into, that's in a completely different key, and it kind of goes, churns and twists, and ooh. We loved it, and it messed people's heads up. Because mm. everybody, everybody who's like, oh, I love Enola Gay. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is this record? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it, it doesn't seem like the rest of the album. It doesn't, it's not like a, an opening song sometimes you think is, how the album will mean to go on. And yeah. this one's like, it has... I mean, nowadays, I mean, the record company would say, you put your lead single on first. I know. You know, 
but we, we were in this you know luxurious position to do whatever that. And you wanted. sequenced the album yourself? Always. We always sequenced that. And was there a special We idea? argue with each other, but we don't have to argue with, with the record anyone company. else. That's good, yeah. 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 And, and was why, why this specific order? Do you remember any kind of decisions that you made? I think New Stone Age actually went first because it was yeah. so different to everything else. So, there's nowhere else to put it. There's nowhere else to put it. <laughs> right. Start with it and then we'll sequence the rest of it because the rest of it hangs together. Mm -hmm. We put um, it together as a journey, really. We wanted it to be a journey. It's a whole album to be played. Mm -hmm. uh, we so that was, We wanted a flow to it, yeah. Yeah, that was the other thing is that we didn't used to sit in the studio and just try to write hit singles. And then the songs that weren't good enough to be hit singles were the album tracks. We would like, okay, you know, oh, this one's sounding like a single. That's great. That's going to be poppy. Yeah. But we would consciously do something like this is never going to be a single mm -hmm. but we're having fun you know so there's lots of different styles and textures so they're not all songs to better or worse songs you know it was just like when we'd finish them we'd go okay that one might be a single that one might be a single because they're kind of catchy and melodic and the rest weren't weren't intended to be singles and that's fine we they're, they're not failed singles mm -hmm. they were always intended to be something songs. else yeah mm -hmm. just songs for the album yeah, yeah. Do you have a favorite song on the album, each of you? Um, I mean, Sealand is great, but uh, beginning and the end, I love actually. Mm. And I love playing it just recently. We, we did it, played it down the front. We all, we came down on, with little synths down, down the front uh, at the show on the last tour, and all four of us in a row and very craft work, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and played beginning and the end, and it was just beautiful, I loved it. Mm. The funny thing is actually, the song that, because Paul and I are very different, very different people. Mm. We have very different mentalities musically and everything. It's probably why we work. Mm. Yeah, mostly. Mostly. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but <laughs> the one song that isn't on this album, that was written for this album, but then went on to the Dazzle Ships album, the song that we both agree is actually our favourite ever oh, yeah, yeah. song is The Romance of the, the Telescope. telescope yeah. oh. That was a B-side and then be went on to the, the, the Dazzle Ships album. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that would be my favourite song from the that architectural period. morality oh, period. Okay, yeah. But uh, although I have to say, we actually, love I love navigation. Actually, navigate. I listened to it recently. Actually, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's just a belting song yeah. with your dog barking in the background. <laughs> That's right. One, one of the one of the old tapes from from his mother's back room. The the, the Cameron, the the the, the, t the dog was barking. But, uh, but <laughs> I remember first time we went to uh, Greece. And Alex and George picked us up. That they were the record company, but they're also mad OMD fans. So as soon as we get in, they're like, "Oh, we signed this, signed that." And then Alex goes, "What are the lyrics to Navigation?" They put on the cassette. I'm like, "Because I can't work out what you're singing." Mm. And I said, "I'm really sorry, Alex. There are no lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> I never finished the lyrics. It's the just, phonetics. It's just, it's just, it's just a I'm just, it's just a scat vocal. It's yeah. just like one, one, one is all, and two, yeah. two far away, three." Yeah. Is all that is all. It's just like there are no lyrics. We usually Which, do that to, to, to get the tune mm -hmm. and then replace them with lyrics quite often. Mm -hmm. But this was like, we needed a B-side, we've got this, it's not finished, have it. <laughs> but I, but I, 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 I love, I love... I, I love that it does that. One of my favourite OMD moments is, I'm being completely egotistical now, yeah. but you wrote it, so it's all right. I can, I can say that I like <laughs> what you did. Yeah, right. Is when it drops and then it comes back in with the melotron, that... Da, na, na, na. Mm. I'm like... Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful moment, isn't it? That is you know, yeah. something you made yeah it's just touching your own soul and every time i hear that i don't listen to it every day but i just go oh that, yeah, talks, that still talks to me still talks to me well that kind of brings me to my final question before we listen to the album when you look back 40 years to this album and you're apart from it now but you're still mm -hmm. playing it but you're yeah. you can take a look back to we your 21 year old selves and have perspective yeah. how do you feel about the album now I'm incredibly proud of it, personally. Mm -hmm. I, th I still think it works. I still think, I mean, you know, sonically production, you know, as, uh, techniques have come on a long way since then. And, you know, it's a bit rough around the edges, but that's part of its charm, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Richard Mannering managed to make a good sounding record out of our madness. So yeah. Yeah, that worked. Um, I, it's still one of my favorite, if not my yeah. favorite record that yeah. we've ever made. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I mean, I, I still, I mean, when, when Colleen plays it, we're going to leave the stage because we will sit here going, God, I wish we could remix it. I mean, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I mean, listen, like you know, far too loud. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, the, you know, you've probably heard the story before about you know, standing on stage at Top of the Pops, ab about to do Joan of Arc, and it starts with that boom, cha cha, and I'm standing. It's number five in the chart, and I'm going, 
God, that bass drum sounds shit. I <laughs> really wish I could change the sound of that bass drum. And it's in the it's top, top five. You know, so yeah. it, 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 it's, it, you know, we, we always think we could change it, but no, it, this, it takes about six to nine months after you've made an album mm. when you to get perspective. You can be objective yeah. about it. You're not just listening to it going, oh God, I wish I'd changed, I wish I'd changed that. Wish I'd changed you that. stand back and you forget all the pain. And it's, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, now, 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 now I see the overview and I'm, yeah, we're very proud of it. Well, let's give a hand to Andrew and Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to put this album on. I ask that you uh, make sure your phones are turned off um, and please refrain from talking. Uh, if you are going to make any comments on the music, just whisper. Don't, don't project like an American. And <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you won't hear yourselves anyway. Look at the size of these speakers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, we we will see speakers. you later for some more questions. Uh, so thank yeah. you. So, listen, yeah, thank you for coming this. out in a tube strike and I making know. it happen. Appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, you're amazing. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I'll see you in a minute. Great. Right. Great listeners. Well done. It was really nice. <laughs> well done, yeah. DJ. Yeah. yeah well done. It was a difficult, difficult job. But seriously, what did you think about the kick drum in Jonah? <laughs> <laughs> Too loud, right? <laughs> a bit boxy, I thought. So we have time for some questions. Um, who would like to start? Okay, very eager gentleman right there. Architecture morality. Okay, um, that was a book. <laughs> yeah, uh, Martha Ladley, who was Peter Savile's girlfriend, who was in Martha and Muffins, the keyboard player. She said to me, "I'm reading this book called Morality and Architecture. It's a great name for an album. Why don't you do?" I was like, "Okay, thanks very much." Um, <laughs> as you do. Um, we just moved the words around. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the name of the band. I mean, you know, we're going back to the. Warm leatherette. I mean, Paul and I used to go to Eric's all the time to see bands. And so we decided, okay, we're going to dare to go on stage just once to do a gig as the two of us doing our songs, just to say we've done it. And so we knocked really sheepishly on the door because you were talking about Roger Eagle. Mm -hmm. Roger Eagle was about nine feet tall. He was scary. Really scary. Really, really scary. And, and, and we were like, we're going to knock on the door. We're going to hope Roger isn't in the office. It's going to be Pete. And we said, Paul and Andy, we, we were in the id, we played here last month. Could, could we do a gig on Thursday night, just like the two of us with a tape recorder playing, playing electronic. our electronic songs? Yeah. And they went, yeah, yeah, sure, what you called? And went, oh. Shit, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we haven't got a name, we thought we'd tell us to fuck off. So, <laughs> we, so we, we, went, we went home and literally went to my bedroom wall where I used to write things down. And, and the, an idea for a song title was Orchestral Maneuvers. And we thought, right, it's two of us playing songs our mate's not even sure about in a punk club with a tape recorder. We just want a name that's different. So that we, we, just, we just chose a preposterously different name, the, the yeah. sort of name that no band should ever be called. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, we kind of got lucky that we chose that one because the name below Orchestral Movers in the Dark was Margaret Thatcher's Afterbirth. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it could have been worse. <laughs> it's worse. hard to believe, but it could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> MTAB. <laughs> Really good. That is a true story. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, another question. There's a gentleman right there. Up here. Oh, I guess that one. You're yeah, on. that's fine. <laughs> Lucky you. Hi. Um, just a couple of things. Um, can you tell us a bit about Gravity Never Failed and when it failed to be on the album? Because I, I think it was meant to be or it was going to be, mm -hmm. wasn't it, early on? Um, and secondly, Hearing you speak early on, Andy, you mentioned, well, one of my favourite lyrics of all yours is uh, the more we, the, the less we know, the more, the more we know, the less we learn. Yeah. And I happened, I heard you mention that actually when you were talking earlier about Joan of Arc. Yeah. So 
are the two related? Uh, so with she's leaving, did, did the lyrics come after you uh, sort of been talking about or learning about Joan of Arc? Was there any link there whatsoever? Connection. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, she's leaving is not related to the Joan of Arc songwriting process. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think very much. I mean, you know, my, my sense of creativity is a celebration of the fact that it's like I quite like not knowing where I'm going. I quite like not, you know. I mean, in real life, it's rubbish. You what you want certainty, but when you're being creative, it's quite nice to just swim in this pool and see what happens. Um, but 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, what was the first part of the question again? Gravity yeah. never fails. Oh, gravity never fails. I mean, that was. We went into the manor to, um, to, uh, to record, because of the success of Enola Game, we didn't have a second single off the album. We, we, we were looking for another single, and we actually had a song that <coughs> was originally called Georgia. Georgia yeah. That was the original song called Georgia, and it was the drums. And it was, when we recorded it, we just went... It's okay, but it's not, not a hit same. single, so we, we, we wouldn't release. So we just we held it back, and then it did eventually get released, and we, we changed the title. Thanks. This yeah, lady right here. Related to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was wondering why uh, She's Leaving has only been released as a single in the Benelux mm. and not elsewhere. Yeah, well, it's his fault. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, there, there, <laughs> there, was, there was a conversation with the record company who said, wow, you know, we've had three singles. Three hit singles. Being great. Uh, we think there's another one on the album. She's Leaving is a great song. That could be a single. That could be a hit. And I s distinctly remember saying, you're not prostituting our art by releasing four <laughs> singles off one album. I'm pretty sure that's what you said. Yeah. <laughs> I could slap my 22-year-old self sometimes. <laughs> so because, because Joan of Arc wasn't released as a single on the rest of the world, because the rest of the world worked more, worked more slowly, so they were still working Made. Souvenir and then into Maid, mm -hmm. we thought, well, oh, you know, all right, we'll, we'll let Benelux have it. And it wasn't a bloody hit. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But no, yeah, I was a pretentious, precious little bugger. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> there have been times when he wanted to slap me too. <laughs> there have been times he wanted to slap me too, so it's all right. I think we'll take a question from one of our viewers at home. Yeah, we've got a lot of um, questions coming in from the online audience, which is great, um, from all over the place. Um, I was going to ask, have you guys thought about doing a pin-up calendar? But I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe 40 years ago, but not now. <laughs> That was from Stephanie Letizia in Guernsey. Oh, it was. <laughs> One of the OMD Women's Guild, of course. Yeah, yeah the, the bra throwers. The bra throwers. <laughs> the bra throwers, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you've answered that Thanks, one. Thanks, Steph. Um, <laughs> um, there she is. And the, the, here's, here's one from Matthew T. So it's about, would you, if you had the technology you have today back then, how would the textures of the album or the Oh, of the album oh it would be, it'd be, it'd be a completely different band, probably. I mean, this is what I was alluding to before, you know, when, you know, because as kids we wanted to be craftwork, but technically we couldn't be craftwork. And that's why we had the sound that we had, because we were kind of limited by our technology. So I'm not sure. We probably would have sounded an awful lot more like craftwork, because, you know, as kids we, we idolized them, you know, we wanted to be craftwork as, as a 15 year old I did, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so, it, it's, it's amazing, because, you know, we started out with, you know, my left-hand bass guitar, his auntie's cannibalized radios, then little plinky pianos and things, and, you know, a synth from my mother's catalogue. And now, you know, it's in the box. It's all in a, in a Mac computer. And you've got m all of these soft synths that come up. And, and there's a lot of purists who are like, why are you not using analog synths? It's like, because they go out of tune. I don't want to plug them in. I don't want to MIDI them. And every time I want to recall the song, when it's in the computer, I just go... It comes straight back up. I don't have to wire up. You know, spend three hours looking at my notes going, OK, VCF. <laughs> and it, no, I'm sure it doesn't sound the same. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I love the modern technology. And for the most part, me well, the, for, for me, the greatest thing is the, 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 the live technology is... Yeah. 
more yeah. reliable. Yeah. Uh, we still have screw-ups, but it, it's, it's, it's more reliable than the, the old tapes and the analogs. But yeah, I mean, it's, we never could have imagined, never could have imagined what we'd yeah. have access to. It's fantastic what we can do now. Uh, the gentleman up there in the red. Oh, we have yeah. the, uh, over here, this one, then you. Oh, so. Hi, uh, you, you talked we? about your creative process, and it's really interesting to hear you talk about being able to use VSTs and having everything inside a Mac. How do you deal with that kind of tyranny of choice where, you know, you go to lay down a bass drum and you've <coughs> got a choice of 4,000? How do you create yeah. sort of limits uh, to help you not have to spend all day trying to find one sound? He's up yeah. there, Paul, uh, if you yeah, can't I see can't. him. <laughs> Over here. I'm absolutely blind. Where are you? He is going to have to oh, wear okay. He's going to have to give up his vanity and wear glasses yeah, on stage. Yeah. I, I can only just see him as well. Uh, <laughs> is anybody out there? <laughs> uh, the yeah, tyranny of the choice, tyranny choice. Is, is a phrase that we use. So yeah. um, we, we had to learn, didn't we? I mean, yeah. you, you get to this point where you you, get lost, you, you've you? got all of these possibilities and it's too much. Uh, one of the things that we, 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 we really made into an ethos a few years ago was, you know, more is not always better. And, and, you know, when we were younger, we were working with a 24 or a 16 track tape. You had to make editorial decisions. You couldn't yeah. just go, well, we'll have these four bass drums. And, well, we've got six hi-hat patterns and different chords. Well, I've, the, we, the chords could be on this organ or that organ. Or, or that we'll decide or later. We'll decide later. And then you just okay. end up, uh, just... Uh, and, and so we have consciously now decided to, to, to say, right, Commit things. Delete, commit, stop, yeah. use that, use that, get rid of that. And it's it's hard because you do feel like, ooh, I'm deleting something, I can't go back. But actually it it forces you to go forward and and limit, limit yeah. your options because you know, electricity. But <laughs> if you look at the multi-track of electricity, it's eleven tracks. Yeah. And five of them are drums, three of them are white noise. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's so simple. It was just right. We had no options then. It was yeah. just whatever we had, you know. I mean, one, one, so. of, our, one of my other favourite phrases is, it's like, a lot of times when, you, when you've got too many options, you just, you just pour it all in and you go, well, it, it's not sounding right, but I'll just add more of this just and I'll more, shine more, this and I'll more, polish yeah. this and I'll add more, add more varnish to it. It's like, my mantra <laughs> is, you don't need a million quids worth of varnish if you don't start with a turd. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly, you know? yeah. Don't yeah. polish it. It ain't going to get any better. <laughs> Bin it off and do something else. I mean, when I we use that expression all the time. <laughs> when we did the, um, when, it's, it's a good expression. When we did the punishment to luxury, um, we we just finished doing uh, uh, dazzle ships uh, live, and we were putting all these, trying to play all these songs, and we had to go back to the multi tracks, and we were looking at the songs on dazzle ships, and they were so incredibly simple mm. that that w when we were doing the punishment to luxury, we were going well, you know. We used to have, we have hardly anything in it. Less is definitely more. And so with Punishment of Luxury, we've really stripped back, didn't we, and just mm. deleted so much stuff mm. to, to make, just, just left what was important and deleted everything else. You have to be ruthless. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely ruthless. Not easy, but you have to. Uh, we'll get to you after. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi. Um, is there any song you've heard that you've gone, I really wish I'd written that? Oh, there's yeah. tons. Yeah. But warm one, leatherette. One. Warm leatherette. Autobahn. Yeah. Uh, Most of the Beatles catalogue <laughs> publishing is amazing. <laughs> You're just thinking financially now. <laughs> so? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, and I, and I, I still hear, I mean, um, Dancing on My Own, the album version, not the single version by Robin. Oh, God. And that's, talk about stripped down, that's, that's only that's got like anything 12 in tracks in it, you know. Mm. Yeah, very rarely do I hear something that, so I'm speaking personally now, but very rarely do I hear something where I just go, wow. And that's why, one of the reasons I think why we started making music was because it's like, I, certainly again, speaking personally, most music I didn't like when I was a kid. I, on, on one hand I could count, and it's like, you know, David Bowie, Roxy Music, Brian Eno, Kraftwerk, Noi, Velvet Underground, all right, one hand and one finger. <laughs> um, and, and, and I thought the rest was mostly crap. Um, and so it was like, you know, I didn't but think we could do it better, but it was a bit of this yeah. incentive. But, but yeah, sometimes you just, yeah, you do. So, um, 
Yeah, there's, there's not often, but when you hear it, you are green with envy. Yeah, yeah. I wish I'd done that. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think we should do one more online one. Uh, sure, you. yeah. Here's a, here's, here's a little forward-looking question. It's, it's about the new album, Bauhaus Staircase. This question comes from uh, Helga Santemeyer in Bavaria. Uh, the new album, Bauhaus Staircase, will it be released later this year? It's looking like early next year. It's looking now. like early next year, yeah. Uh, the, well, the dilemma we have because of COVID is everything is just out of sequence and we're trying to catch up with things we promised the to touring do. And and touring and stuff. So, so this you know, year we're busy doing a lot of gigs. And yeah, I mean, yeah, we're finally going to go to America in April and May to do the tour that we did in the UK over two years ago, the Souvenir you know, Celebration Tour. So it's, it's just... Um, we, we, it, 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 yeah, it's coming out. I mean, listen, it's yeah. mostly written. It's just down to Paul to stop moving house and having children. <laughs> <laughs> He's not wrong. How dare he? Paul's in his court now. <laughs> <laughs> He's the mixer. But yeah, early, early next year. Early next year. Great. A question over here. Did you have a question right, right here? Oh, you do have one? You have a question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come over. <laughs> okay. Obviously, I'm from the uh, Pretty in Pink era. <laughs> and I've only seen you guys once in Dallas, which okay. was amazing. Okay. And um, this is my favorite album. And I was supposed to have tickets here to see it in Cambridge and Friles, Aylesbury, but COVID messed that up. Oh. And so the, the one that sticks out in my mind always is, is Georgia. And yeah. I wonder where you get your your samples to do it. It just it it, it boggles my mind. Yeah. Well, they were they were shortwave. We had a shortwave radio. Yes. Okay. And we used to uh, on architecture reality and and for dazzle ships, we used to kind of record our shortwave radio every night. And we used to kind of just we had tons of tape, didn't we? We just used to kind of because it's random what you find, and we just used to scan the channels. In fact, radio waves on dazzle ships is, is that radio scanning it's the, the channels. It's the digital. Do, 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 do. It's trying to find a station. You know. But, but the, the, cor the chorus of the song Georgia is basically, it, it's, it's a classic kind of like, I'd written the verse, and we had this chord change, and we had this chorus, and it's like... We didn't know what to do in the you chorus. You got any ideas? No, I haven't got any ideas. You got any ideas? Right, get the radio yeah. out. Let's sample a load of stuff <laughs> off the radio. Cut up the tapes and throw it in and see what I'm... Amazingly, it Manon works. Manon, do the Oh, It's like, yeah, that'll do. That's the chorus. <laughs> um, so, but it, but works. it works. It fits mm. right and, it, in and it's actually in key, which is... And of course... And of course, it, it's about the Cold War and it's about the Soviet Union and yeah. that seems to be sadly current at the moment. Mm. But yeah, but that's... Um, that that yeah, Georgia was 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 is a, it it is it was intentionally a kind of geopolitical song, dancing in the ruins of the Western world. You know? It was a kind of a prequel to Dazzle Ships. Thank you, yeah, really. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, you both say you're quite different from each other. Yeah. Over the years, was it, would you say there's something you've each learnt from the other that's perhaps changed how you are, sort of from back when I you mean, were younger to how you are now? That makes sense. Mm. Let me think. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think we're always learning from each other. I mean, I, I think in, in songwriting terms. I mean, I mean, I think because we both couldn't play, you know, just in pure musical terms now. Because we you never play. taught me to play keyboards, and you haven't learned bass. That's, that, that hasn't <laughs> that's changed. That's not changed. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, but, but I think, uh, you know, we think we learned. We're screwed here. She's asked a question we've never had a bloody answer oh, no. before. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Damn you, woman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we, we kind of we, we learned to, to to write songs together, and we kind of learned each we, as as we as we both individually learned how to write songs. I think we were teaching each other how how to go through that process because no one taught us, so we both had to kind of learn it individually and and kind of guide each other through it. Really, I have learned from Paul how to be. A slightly better engineer. I've learned. I've learned what. Yeah. I've learned what things. I, I learned what a compressor does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took me about forty years, but I've learned what a compressor. Now you know what it does. Well done. Um, but I, I think. I think in some respects we kind of. We kind of leave the demarcation. Actually, it's like that's a Paul job. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah, whenever, we do. like when yeah, it when it do. comes to mixing, it's like I just get on with it. You yeah. start making it sound sonically right. I've done, you know, we, you know we, we're called the butcher and the surgeon, you know. It's like, 
I, I will chop it all up and then he'll stitch it back together again and make it sound. But then I will go back in and say, right, it all sounds lovely, but you've lost the feel. Let me screw it up for you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, then, um, and then I pull it back and then we, uh, then we have a final record. Yeah, we, 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 were, we were in his studio yesterday we arguing yesterday, about yeah. bass drums. Actually, there was three bass drums. That was the problem. There were three bass drums. Yeah, should have only been one. Um, but no, I, 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 think, I think we have learned stuff, but I, I think sometimes, sometimes it's quite good to not actually think about it too much and just, just you know, Let it. know that the other person brings something that you don't have. Yeah. Um, Andy, you secretly miffed that um, Paul sang your biggest UK hit. <laughs> and Paul... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Woo. Provocative question there. And, and Paul, can you remember right. the two songs that kept it off number one? I mean, the thing is, Andy wrote Hole again, so he got to number one. Mm. So uh, I remember going around to Paul's house in the early 90s uh, because actually you're not factually completely correct. No, as, no. A, du as a duo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had to go to his house to ask him about some keyboard Business sample or something. Or something. Yeah. Um, and Sailing on Seven Seas had just got to, to number, number three. three. But so was, was that, was that? And he said, congratulations on getting to number three, but I'm glad you haven't got any higher than Souvenir. <laughs> 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 so, so um, true. true story. Listen, Enola Gay did all the bloody groundwork. He was just climbing. <laughs> he, was sta he was standing on the back of a giant song. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one Couple more, more question right here. Oh, okay. oh. Who, who's talking? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that architecture and morality amongst the general public is kind of considered to be this sort of seminal album of yours. Mm -hmm. But I wondered sort of how you think of it in the context of the rest of your output. Like, do you think of it as this album that really sums up your sound? Or is it like just another album, or is there one that gets overlooked in favour of architecture and morality? Good question. That is a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think it's probably one of our favourites because I think, I think it does work in 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 its entirety. You know, it's, it's a complete album. Every song works, you know, uh, with each other. It's it has a unity. The album, which perhaps some of the album other albums don't have. But, uh, but, yeah, I mean, there are other works. I mean, people do concentrate on architecture and morality, but I'm very proud of the first album. I'm proud of Dazzle Ships. I'm proud of The Punishment of Luxury. You know. What I would say about architecture and morality, I mean, there's only nine songs on it. If I listen to it, and I don't listen to our stuff very often, but if I listen to it, I just go, that's a good song, that's a good song. That works. There's no, there's no, no song on that no album fillers, that I don't go, eh, we could have done better. There's bits not quite right about so. So in terms, it's it, 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 it's it's nine A star songs as far as I'm concerned. We 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 got it right. I, yeah. I don't know how we got it right, but I'm I'm very proud of all of those. You, know, you some of you will know that there are other albums where we look back and go, we just didn't have time, and maybe we could have done better than that song and that song. But yeah, no, we're proud of it. I think it's a great place to, to leave it tonight. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, we can't so do more questions. We much. can talk forever, but yes, thank you. and thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you all coming to the Albert Hall in a couple of weeks' time? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're still learning Bunker Soldiers and, yeah. and pretending to see the And future. we won't mention pretending to see the future because we haven't played it for 40 years yeah. and I can't remember the words at the end. But uh, <laughs> I will do by the time we get there. So, yeah, seven, <laughs> seven songs from the first album. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds amazing. So, so thank yeah, you so all. So we've got to go and rehearse. Thank you for watching us. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Oh, thank you. I'll come back and see you in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>